Our passage this morning is 1 Corinthians 15. I'd like to read verses 12 uh, through 22. And this is where Paul focuses on really the, the second part of, of the sermon. Okay? Uh, the first part of it is Jesus came to pay a ransom. Okay? The second part is the resurrection, is really the proof that the ransom has been received. And we'll see Paul arguing this. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then neither will we, because we would still be in our sins. And when we die, we would perish forever. So we'll read it now. We'll look at it um, again in the sermon just to understand uh, Paul's reasoning here, but I think it's fairly clear. So 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12. Paul writes, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. On the first day of the week, the last week of his earthly ministry before his crucifixion, Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now, I imagine you probably thought on the first day of the week, I was going to say Jesus rose from the dead. But I want us to see how Jesus, on more than one occasion, singles out this particular day. It was the day that he rode into Jerusalem, the day in which he presented himself to Israel as her Messiah. It was on this day that he poured out his Holy Spirit upon his disciples at Pentecost. It was actually even the day that, that he gave to John the vision of the judgment that he was going to bring in 70 AD. But as we know, it was also the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. Now, as God had commemorated the, the completion of the Old Covenant by setting apart the seventh day of the week for rest and worship, so our Lord Jesus commemorates the completion of the new creation by setting this first day apart so that we might remember these things, these wonderful things that he has done in the work of redemption and that we might thank him and worship him. I only bring that up because the fourth commandment does say, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And the problem is we often forget that this is the day that Jesus has really risen from the dead. As we read in our call to worship, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now he entered into Jerusalem in this particular way to show Israel who he really was to fulfill what was written by the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 9, verse 9, where he writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a donkey.'" 
The significance of this entry, of course, is that uh, he's fulfilling prophecy. But this was the first time that Jesus publicly presented himself as the Messiah to his people. You remember how throughout his ministry he was telling his disciples, don't tell anyone that I'm the Messiah. And when it was, became apparent to somebody else, he also warned them not, not to tell anyone because it wasn't yet time. But now it was time. And when the crowds cried out, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, knowingly or unknowingly, they were also fulfilling what the Lord said through the psalmist in the psalm we read for our call to worship. If I had read a little bit further in Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, the psalmist writes, O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As the crowds cried out, Hosanna, what that word essentially means is, O Lord, save, do save, save us, we pray. And the title, Son of David, means that they recognize this one who was riding into Jerusalem as the one who had the legal right to the throne of David and the one who was their Messiah. Now they believed, as we've seen before on numerous occasions, that Messiah would be a political and military leader whom God would raise up and send to them to lead them to victory over the Romans. But what he had really come to do was to save them from an even greater enemy, and that was the guilt of their sins that would condemn them forever. Now, God had shown them these things in advance so that they would know when these things came to pass that these were not the attempt of some re religious zealots to form a new religion, which is the way they looked at Jesus and his disciples. But it was something that God was doing to save them from certain destruction. And the Lord told us these things in advance so that when they came to pass, we would know that Jesus was coming also to save us from certain destruction. Now, Jesus knew before he entered the city that they would reject him. During his earthly ministry, I don't know if we, if we recognize this or not, but he had mostly avoided Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem was the center of Judaism. It was basically the, you know, the, the center or the home of the most important religious leaders who hated Jesus and wanted to kill him. Now, Jesus avoided Jerusalem except when the law required his attendance at the feasts. And the reason why he did was, again, because of their hostility. We read in John 7, verse 1, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea, and meaning basically Jerusalem, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, this was something Jesus could not allow before it was time. When his earthly brothers, before they were converted, asked him whether he would go up to the Feast of Booths, now, he said this in John 7 as well, verses 6 and 8, my time is not yet here. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. But now, as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, we see that it was time. He had come to Jerusalem to lay down his life. As he told his disciples, as I read in our basically our memory verse, but also the verse upon which our first point is based, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now this morning, I want us to consider two things briefly from basically these two passages. First, that Jesus came to pay our ransom. But secondly, also that the ransom, or I should say the resurrection, proves that his ransom was accepted. So first, let's consider that Jesus came to pay our ransom. Now, I think we all understand what a ransom is. This word in the original language means this, the price of release. 
the means of setting free. The fact that Jesus came to pay a ransom tells us that we were bound in some sense. And that sense is that we were being held captive by the devil. Now, there are many examples or many things in Scripture to point this out, but let's look at one in particular, what Jesus says to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. Now, when he says this, when he says, how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? What he was telling us was that he had come into the world to take away Satan's power over us. Basically, he was the strong man. Satan was the strong man who had overpowered us and had us captive. He had come to deliver us from the devil's kingdom and to bring us into his own kingdom by overcoming the strong man and setting us free. Paul writes in Colossians 1 verse 13, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Jesus came to save us from the kingdom of darkness, from the, the power the devil had over us. But we need to understand at the same time that even though we were the captives of the devil, the ransom that Jesus paid was not to him. You know, sometimes we might get that impression. Uh, actually, in the history of the church, many had gotten that impression, and you may even hear that preached today, because the Bible does seem to imply that there is a sense in which we belong to this strong man to the devil. But the fact is, we didn't. We didn't belong to him any more than the world belongs to him or the kingdoms of this world. We all belong to God and so do the kingdoms of the world. So what is the sense in which we are captives? Well, we were his captives because that is what we chose to be. We obeyed him because we wanted to obey him. I think we understand that when Adam disobeyed God in the garden, he not only became guilty and sinful, okay, guilty enough to go down into hell forever, sinful enough to follow the devil, to become basically his servant, but Adam made us this way as well. Remember what Paul writes about us in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And let's take this as addressed to us because essentially we fall into the same category. Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too, and Paul includes himself here, all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, as I read this passage, did you hear Paul saying that Satan owned you and he was forcing you into this particular service? You didn't have a choice. You know, you had to do it because the strong man was making you do it. No, that's not what he's saying. He was saying, you did it. I did it because that was what we wanted to do. That's where our hearts were at. It's not because Satan owned us, but it's because we willingly gave our allegiance to him because of the condition of our hearts. So then if Satan did not own us, then to whom did Jesus pay the ransom? Well, he paid it to the one to whom we were indebted. He paid it to God. He had to satisfy his father's justice if he was to set us free from guilt, if he was to set us free from the sentence of hell. And that's what he did, we know quite well, from his obedience and his death. By obeying God's law perfectly, he was able to earn for us a perfect record of obedience <laughs> 
And by dying on the cross, he paid our debt. And let me just remind you again, Jesus is the only one who could have done this. We could never have done this. We owed God an infinite debt. And only one who was of infinite value could possibly pay it. The Bible says Jesus is both God and man. He can pay the debt we owe. And his payment is enough because it is infinite. But again, we had another problem. The problem is because of the corruption of our hearts. We wanted to follow the devil. That's the reason why we were his captives. Adam, in his sin, forfeited God's Holy Spirit. Remember the one that God had given him to work good in him. We call this historically original righteousness. That, that desire within us that is the origin of every good thing that we want to do. The Holy Spirit was that force, uh, that personal force within Adam, causing him to want to do good. But when Adam forfeited the Spirit through his sin, he did that not just for himself, but he did it for us as well. That's why we come into the world not loving God and indisposed toward God and disposed toward the devil. So if Jesus was to free us from the bondage, from our bondage to the devil, he had to be able to bring the Spirit of God back to us through his work he gains the authority to do this. And having sent his spirit into our hearts, he has broken our chains. He has freed us from our bondage to the devil. And now we have willingly joined ourselves to God. Okay, This is what Jesus has done by the payment of the ransom through his life and his death. The ransom is very, very important. It frees us, Okay, redeems us, from sin, the marketplace of sin, the guilt and the power of sin. So now we ask, why is the resurrection also important if Jesus actually accomplished these things through his life and his death? Well, as I've already told you, and hopefully I've told you in advance, so these things will stick with us. The resurrection is the proof that his ransom was accepted. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he, that is the Father, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, because he was perfect in every way, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What does Paul mean by this? He means that the Father laid our sins upon Jesus when he was on the cross. And Jesus became guilty, not of having committed the sins, so to speak, because he never committed any sin. But he took upon himself the ownership of paying for that guilt that we had incurred through our disobedience. He willingly took that. But the Bible, or I should say Paul, also tells us in Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. When Jesus took our guilt upon himself, then he also took upon himself the penalty of our sins, which is death. He died because our sins were charged to him, and his death was the payment. But he was also raised because his death paid the debt. So our sins put him into the grave, but the payment of those sins, which was his death, was also the cause of his release from death. Now, if the Father had not accepted that payment, Jesus would have remained dead. And if his payment had not been accepted, we also would have perished forever. And that's what Paul is arguing in our passage. Now, he's arguing this because apparently some, some of the Corinthians were denying the resurrection. Now, that shouldn't surprise us. Corinth is in Greece. You know, Athens is also in Greece. Remember how the Greek philosophers responded to Paul's message about the resurrection on Mars Hill? Acts 17, verse 32. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. One commentator writes this. 
some Greek philosophical schools viewed embodied life as undesirable. Okay, that remember the Greek dualism, the idea that matter is evil, spirit is good, the goal of life is to get rid of the body and basically to free the spirit from the prison house of the soul to be reunited with the one. Now, this is totally pagan Greek philosophy, but that's what many of them believed and they saw embodied life as undesirable. So they would consider absurd Paul's claim that the one who would judge everyone was designated by God through resurrection from the dead. See, the idea to them obviously was this is the absolute opposite of what we'd expect God to do. The resurrection would then not be something they look forward to, but something they would see as a bad thing. And some, apparently, of the Corinthians believed the same way. So Paul challenges them to consider what the consequences of this line of thinking would actually be. If there is no resurrection, then even Christ hasn't been raised. If there's no resurrection, no one can be raised. If Christ hasn't been raised, then you are still in your sins. And if you are in, still in your sins, then mo those among you, Paul says, who have died, have not gone to be with the Lord in glory, but rather they have perished, that is, they have sunk down into hell. And then Paul concludes by saying, if that is our hope as Christians, then we of all men are most to be pitied because we've pinned our hopes on this glorious future that doesn't exist. We're living a fantasy. If there is no resurrection, then we are done for. That, by the way, that applies to us as well as to the Corinthians because if there is no resurrection, then the payment that Jesus made has not been accepted. It wasn't enough. Jesus was not who he claimed to be. The Father did not, again, receive that payment and so did not release Jesus from death. And if he hasn't been released from death, neither will, will, will we be. Now, thankfully, that isn't the case. Paul goes on to say, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. His resurrection, his release from the consequences of sin means that the Father has accepted his payment. He has become the first fruits of those who are asleep. And what he means by that is the first of many who will be raised from the dead. For as in Adam all die, as all who were a part of the human race were killed by the first Adam, by his disobedience, so also in Christ will all be made alive. And just so we don't misunderstand what that means, he's not saying that everyone in the world is going to be saved by the work of Christ, but what he's saying is that everyone who is in Christ will be made alive, will be raised from the dead to the resurrection of life, those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we trust in him, we are raised spiritually now from death to life. And one day our bodies will be raised from the grave to be caught up with the Lord at that great judgment. Jesus' resurrection is the guarantee, the Father's testimony to us, the proof to us, that if we are trusting in Jesus, we will never perish. So let me just simply ask the question this morning, are you trusting in Jesus and in Him alone, His obedience, His death, to make you acceptable to God? Or are you trying to work out your own righteousness, trying to make yourself acceptable to Him? The Bible says that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in His sight. It's through the law that we come to know about sin and that we are guilty. The law was not given to save us. It was only given to show us that we needed Christ. You must trust in Him. If you are trusting in Him, you will be safe. Okay? You are alive now and you will be raised in the future. But if you're not trusting Him, then trust Him. And as Paul says, you will be safe. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal 
life. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer.